Uh, thank you for joining us. We're super excited to introduce Adam Weiss and Aaron Houseworth from Giant Spoon. And as always, I just wanted to let you know that there'll be about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions for Adam or Aaron, just please drop them in the chat. Jonathan and I will be monitoring and we'll be reading your name and question in the order they're submitted. So if we need you to clarify your question, just be ready to unmute for us. All right, awesome. So our speakers today join us from an agency built on the power of impossible thinking. They shoot for the moon and solve challenges thought to be impossible. Adam is the VP strategy director at Giant Spoon, where he oversees the strategy discipline across both offices, uh, client faces in LA and New York. Adam has led some of the agency's most awarded campaigns, including HBO's Westworld and Game of Thrones act activations at South by Southwest and HP's The Wolf film series starring Christian Slater. After graduating from Brand Center in 2010, Adam worked as a digital strategist at Shia Day LA and later joined a neuroscience startup that aimed to enhance professional athletes' mental performance. And Aaron Houseworth is currently an associate creative director at Giant Spoon and was previously a strategy director in their New York office, working on accounts such as HBO, Netflix, Spotify, Johnny Walker, and MongoDB. Previously, Aaron was a content director for iHeartMedia, senior manager of innovations at OMDB's Ignition Factory, and an innovations manager at Initiative. Throughout her career, she's worked on prominent brands, including Frito-Lay, Discover, Discovery, GE, Arby's, and Bayer. So without further ado, please join us in welcoming Adam and Aaron. What's up, guys? Uh, it's good to be on your screen. We were just chatting before we jumped on the call that, like, man, we really wish we were in the same room with you. Uh, we definitely thrive on verbal feedback and some, like, affirmation as we're presenting. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit harder in this conversation, but um, we're going to, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. We're excited to be here. If you have questions or comments or you like something along the way, like please like share it in the chat. Um, Jonathan and Laura, feel free to, to stop us at any point. Um, I think the annoying line that everyone says is we want, we want to make this a conversation. Um, so I'm going to use that line uh, any way that we can. I'm happy to be up here presenting with Aaron, who we've, uh, her and I have worked together um, quite a bit over the last five years. So I'm going to see if I can, of course, share my screen, and then we'll jump into some of this. All right. Hopefully, we can see that. Cool. Um, so hi. Just a bit of a, of, of a setup. Um, so Aaron and I both, uh, we've been at Giant Spoon for about over five years. I think Aaron just hit her five-year anniversary this past week yes um, I, got, I got a watch it was great yeah we get everyone gets watched <laughs> to be hit that five-year mark um between I've we've both worked in I've in the New York office I've been in LA Aaron I think is the only spoon as we like to call ourselves that has moved from strategy to media to creative um, I think we started when there were about 10 employees at Giant Spoon um, all the way to 150 uh, we were there at a time when there were no creatives or no account people, just a bunch of strategists running around trying to figure out um, how to make things and, and do things. Now to the point where we have, like, we truly are a full service agency. Um, so all to say, we've seen a lot of the different stages at this particular agency and, and uh, the, the ups and downs, the growing pains along the way. Um, so we really want to take this, this opportunity today to kind of tell you uh, like what we've learned, um, the good and the bad, the exciting, and kind of like the key lessons and the principles that we take as we're really approaching the work. So this is overheard at Giant Spoon. If you were in our office or in one of our virtual rooms, things you might hear um, as we kind of work through each of our projects uh, and talk about really whether you are working um, on the account side or creative or strategy or media, um, this is the, the common conversation or things that come up. These, these are things that are not necessarily written on our walls. Um, they're not on our website, uh, but they're very much kind of inform us and in how we think and how we approach the work. Uh, Aaron, anything else to add to that? Um, I think some of what Adam and I were talking about when we were putting this together is 
I know that you guys hear from sort of a wealth of different individuals across the industry. And we were asking ourselves, what are things that we wish that we knew? Or what are the things that, especially for you guys, sort of um, uh, potentially like entering the workforce in pretty short order, uh, what are kind of the, the cheat codes um, to jump to the advanced level of, of advertising, uh, especially knowing that the marketplace is what it is. So I think we, this is us trying to share like some, some hard won wisdom um, that hopefully uh, sort of prepares you guys for whatever's coming next. All right, so you're at Giant Spoon. What are you gonna hear? The first thing, that we tend to say and talk a lot about is do not blindly accept the client brief. Some people say there are good briefs, there are bad briefs, or there never are bad briefs. Like I will say there are bad briefs. Um, and a lot of them do tend to come from, from clients. And I think the thing that we've really identified or we've seen over and over again is a client will come to you with a specific problem. And as you dig into that problem, you start to realize like, I don't, I don't think this is it. Um, there's maybe a much larger problem that we need to start to solve. Or they might come to you and say, hey, Giant Spoon Agency, we need uh, we needed you to create a social video or a content series or an experience or a, a commercial, whatever it might be. In a lot of ways, they kind of prescribe themselves the, the medicine to solve a problem they don't really have. Um, so there's so many times that like when we get that initial brief from the client, um, we get in a room together, strategist, creative account, the full team, uh, and just really look at like that, that client brief and ask ourselves, like, what are some of those preconceived notions that we have? But the one key question we ask is like, what's the potential? What is the potential in this particular brand and this project? Can we see something that is bigger, uh, a bit more beyond what the client is looking at? So um, I definitely want to encourage you to ask questions when you get that brief, like poke at it. Um, try to figure out like what's really behind it. So I'm going to take you through actually a, an example of this for, I think Jonathan mentioned the wolf um, that has kind of been this, this long part series, but uh, we're going to chat about like where it ultimately began and, and where it had went since then. This is the brief that we got from the client. Um, and I'll talk about like what it ultimately became, but they asked us to create a tactical local activation plan for Black Hat Security Conference. It's this big security conference in Las Vegas every year. Uh, high impact recommendations, compelling, engages our tar target audience and achieves our marketing objective. Um, so a lot of buzzwords. Uh, if you're kind of thinking like, I have no idea what this means, you're, you're not alone. We felt the same way and really trying to decipher, okay, what are, what are you guys asking for? Um, and in some ways, I think that like, you, it's easy to look at a brief like this and be like, God, it's like a total dud. Um, like, what am I possibly going to create with this? And this particular brief is for printers, office printers. So now you're like, cool, I am working on office printers for B2B to create something at some security conference. Like, what could I even possibly do? And then to kind of add to that, when we really dug into it and started to question and, and talk to them and ask them more questions, what they really wanted was like a one-time sponsorship or maybe think like the, you know, just B2B, like a business booth and an exhibit hall of a convention center um, or a video that just plays at this, this, one, this one time. And this is something that we've kind of seen over and over again, especially with some of our B2B clients. Um, and we always like urge them of that. Uh, a lot of times that they're so focused on product features or quick one-off stunts or activations, or how do we create white papers and provide all of the information we could possibly want to share um, with our audience. Um, but we believe like B2B doesn't have to be boring. So we started to dig into this, this, the brief. The objective that they gave us was generate awareness for printer security risks and increase consideration for HP as the leader in print security. Um, so Kind of when they approached us, their thinking was, okay, we know we have all of these IT professionals at a security event. Let's talk to them. Let's get them aware about our printers and that they're super secure. Um, the first question that we had was, uh, what is printer security? Like, what, is that, what does that even mean? Um, what are the risks? We genuinely did not know. So that was an opportunity for us to kind of become more knowledgeable and to figure it out for ourselves. Um, as we started digging into it, it got super interesting. Um, we found that like there is this, this perception that someone, yes, people can hack into your printer. 
but kind of the, the risk of it is I could hack into your printer and someone could print off something that you don't want printed. Um, it could be explicit photos, it could be inappropriate jokes, it could just be a bad prank in some ways. And that was kind of the thought of like, oh, you get access to the printer and you can just print off things on someone's printer. But really when we started digging into it, we found like, oh shoot, if, if someone hacks into your printer that's in the office, all of the data that has gone through that, so think logins, passwords, like confidential information, social security, they now have access to all of that. Uh, and that's starting to stand out. So all of a sudden, like, okay, this brief is getting a little bit more interesting. Like that's starting to be a pretty cool story. Um, and we know that HP in that case had all of this great security features built into their printers, but um, we were kind of wondering, do people care about it or do they know about it or, or why is it worth thinking about? Um, so the stat that changed it all, um, and again, mind you, we haven't written a brief for ourselves yet. We've just read the client brief. Like it's only a couple days in, we're starting to dig in and figure out like, what's the potential, what's the story. But we found this stat pretty early on that said, 98% of office printers in the US, so all 98% of these office printers that sit in the office, these, these sexy machines like you see right here, are not protected with any security uh, measures at all. So really anyone can hack into it and pretty much all these IT professionals either don't know or they don't care. Um, so we kind of followed that lead. Okay, who's, who's the audience? And HP told us, our audience, they are uh, IT decision makers who are passionate about technology and want to be in the know. Um, I, I wanted to share the photos that were included with this particular brief of the audience, but I, I just can't. Um, but in the words of Aaron, uh, they were photos of stodgy middle-aged dudes wearing Dockers um, and behind like big beige computers. So seeing that we're like, okay, this, there's clearly a very outdated perception of who IT decision makers are. So we need to kind of dig into them and understand, okay, what's, what's making them tick and how are they thinking? And kind of a quick tangent. Um, I know this is something that you guys, I'm sure you guys talk about a lot, but uh, we always want to make sure that we're understanding our audience as people, um, especially when we're working in the B2B space, not just as their job title. We're not trying to talk to this particular person because they're an IT manager and all they do are IT things and all they read are IT things. Um, but how can we start to understand them as, as humans? Like what's happening in their world? What are they watching online? What are they doing um, when they're not at work? And that has always been a really critical piece. So that's what we wanted to start to dig into. Like, yes, we know they're IT decision makers, but how do we start to build out some more context and interest uh, around them? So we came across another uh, stat that changed it all. Uh, we found that 70% of IT decision makers are millennials. Um, this seems simple, but this shook the walls of HP. Um, and their minds, again, they were def it was definitely a much older audience. In fact, we found this stat from their own information um, and started using it and starting to build up some of the context of, okay, if they're millennials, what are they consuming? What are they watching? Um, and a lot of times clients will have the data. They just don't always know how to read it or how to interpret or how to contextualize it in a way that makes it relevant for marketing. This isn't something that we went out and kind of did our own study. It was buried in a stack of papers that they had on their desk for a while. Um, but for us, this started to tell us like, okay, they're younger than we, than we expected. Printer security is an interesting story because all these printers are unprotected. Um, and then also at the time that was season one of Mr. Robot and that was pre Rami Malek before the, his Oscar win, um, but still kind of coming up uh, and becoming much bigger. So security and cybersecurity was a, a, a growing conversation in popular culture. Um, and we were seeing it in terms of kind of these dramatic films like or a series like Mr. Robot, but also just in the type of humor that they have um, online and the way that they, they talk and joke. So with all this information, um, you saw the original brief. Once we kind of chased this down, we told HP like, hey, we really like, let us go off and do a full audience deep dive um, to understand IT decision makers. We think there's an immense potential here to really start to understand that can not only just inform what we do at this particular security conference, but the way that we talk to them across everything that we do. So we went off and did that. Um, the second thing is we came up with a, a, a concept for uh, this security conference that kind of grew beyond itself. And that's ultimately what became The Wolf. So The Wolf was this dramatized film series starring Christian Slater. Uh, it turned into a four-year creative platform 
uh, led to huge results for them just in terms of printer sales. Um, and very much kind of became this, this much longer enduring platform that told this entire story um, that really started to present the problem that we're starting, we were seeing in all these offices of unprotected printers um, and then presenting HP as a solution. We not only were able to do uh, drama, but we, I still don't know how they let us make this, um, but we created this ridiculous three-part video series um, called The Computer Show. Um, and it was based off of this PBS show um, in the 70s and 80s called Computer Chronicles. In this show, we actually had two employees from the HP talk to uh, the host of the show, Gary Favorite, and, and sell uh, him their, the latest printer that they had. So it is, it's ridiculous, it's funny, but it's like right on par with the, the humor that we were seeing from IT decision makers. So just to kind of wrap up this first, this first message that Every time you get a brief, like I would just continue to, to dig into it, to question, to find an interesting story um, and really challenge and push the clients and say like, hey, we think there's so much more potential than just some, doing something at a security conference or making this one-off video. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do that can continue to, to last uh, beyond this one, this one stop uh, or this one moment. So moving on, um, a strategist will also ask, I think this is really important coming off the wolf, um, I would just say, you're gonna come up with a lot of ideas that you're gonna fall in love with. Uh, you're gonna be all for them. You're gonna say like, man, we're just gonna show them to the client and they're gonna buy it. It's gonna be beautiful. They'll totally get it. Um, obviously that's not always the case. Uh, as you're kind of going through this, especially the ideas you love more than the others, like really, really take the time to kind of detach yourself from it and ask, okay, why won't they buy this idea? Like fast forward to the future. They didn't like your idea. Um, and try to reverse engineer and think about, okay, why didn't they, why would they not buy this? Why didn't they buy it? Is it, was it off strategy? Did it not achieve the objective? Is it, did they not have the money? Is the timing wrong? Should we have waited or held on to this? Um, so especially as you think about the, the wolf and some of these other things, and even just in, internally um, uh, at, at Brand Center, as you come up with these ideas, take a moment as a team to ask this question because it's really gonna give you the ammunition to go into these meetings uh, and hopefully address all of these questions or concerns before they ever come up from clients. Cool, so I think one of the other things that someone will say is, around a Giant Spoon is make your client the closer. Um, I think especially um, for those of you guys who are, are studying creative, I think there's a, a bit of a false perception that there's that you know, that quintessential Don Draper moment where you walk into a room and you woo them with your beautiful words and they buy the idea sight unseen. But I think something that people don't necessarily talk about is the sales process is long and it is a sales process. Um, I, I would say normally from the moment of like the cursory pitch to like in market, if you're lucky, it's six months, sometimes it's nine months. And it's definitely a bit of a slog. Um, and so I, I think something that, uh, that people will find is sort of the other side of the coin of what Adam was saying about, you know, why won't they buy this? Um, I think some, something you'll hear a lot in our industry is like, oh, our client just doesn't get it. Or um, I need to be the one to explain it because this is so complex and only I'm eloquent enough to make something that's really complicated sound really simple. If that's the case, your odds of, of, of selling that idea are not that high. Our job is to the, once you have that sort of big, beautiful meeting, that, that moment where you like make the room fall in love with you, you then have to make your client's boss and your client's boss's boss and your client's boss's boss's boss fall in love with that idea. So I think one part of our job is conceptualizing really brilliant things, but the other part of our job is, is becoming sort of an ardent defender of those ideas. And that means arming your clients with stats, um, additional information, like most of the time, every single C-suite member at the table has a different primary concern, a different question. One person is asking, how will this drive profitability? One person is asking, how will this drive brand impact? One person is asking, how will this further my career and make me look good so I can get that next promotion? And I think sometimes our natural instinct is, as creatives is to say, um, like, why am I pandering to all these personalities? But it, it's, so that, it's so that you can your idea can get sold. Um, and so I think probably 50% of the time, Adam and I are, are spending time 
crafting campaigns and and copy and writing strategies, but 50% of the other time, we're really sort of coaching our clients through this process. And rather than um, getting defiant or bristling at their questions, we're hearing them and then saying like, okay, how do we give them more information to, to make the case for this? How do we make this as foolproof and, and bulletproof as, as possible? So I think that's, that's one thing that there, there's a, a, there's a real, there's a real part of our job that's almost lit, litigious in nature of sort of collecting all these facts and making it a rational empirical argument for good, good work. And it's, it's why I love working with Adam, who I, I refer to as the Meryl Streep of, of Giant Spoon. Um, if you go to, which he loves, if you go to the next slide, um, and another lesson above and beyond making your client the close and really making your client the hero um, is leadership will say, bring your clients gifts. Um, I think something that we've experienced in the course of the last five years, 10 years, people are, they're really moving away from an AOR model, more and more work is project-based, uh, more and more, uh, more and more uh, clients are looking for agencies or partners based off of the brief or the challenge in front of them. So it's really incumbent upon you as the, the creative, the strategist, the technologist um, to provide additional value, to provide bonus value. Um, and so uh, part of our like part of our mission and part of what makes us special as an agency that I would recommend to anybody is um, bringing your client your client an idea that that wasn't part of a brief. Um, so sometimes it could be, uh, some of the things that we do, we provide trend reports for clients. Um, we also try to meet our clients where they are. I think Adam has examples where him and like one of our co-founders have like sent Snapchats with ideas to clients and like they might like respond uh, with a smiley face, which means they like them or they might like ghost you and not respond at all, um, which also happens. Uh, but some of our best work was, was a gift. It was sometimes, I think we all know this, like a brilliant idea could be born outside of a brief. It could happen when you're on a long walk or when you've just been uh, breathing and like living a brand for a long time. So some of the examples for us are like payday is like a time loop comedy that we did around one of our financial clients. And it happened because, uh, 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 we were on a plane flying back from a shoot for a completely different project. And somebody just had an idea and wrote it down and shipped it to a client. And it was just bought sight unseen. Um, and there's a lot of examples I'm going to take you guys through for GE as well, where um, it was, uh, they were just ideas of like, there was an emerging technology or there was something coming down the pike that we thought was kind of a perfect creative canvas for that client. Um, and we just sent them an email unsolicited and said like, Hey, we think this would be really cool. Um, so I, I would be willing to say like some of our best work are, uh, the work that gets most recognized and, um, and is sort of like pure good thinking. I would say about 50% of them were gifts. They just started as an unsolicited text or an email or a phone call that turned into a great idea. I was um, just going to add too, I think that uh, this is also relevant just internally, like bring your team gifts. I think back to when I was at Shiat when I first graduated from VCU um, as a junior strategist. I what One of the things that I did that I'm so glad I, I do and I continue to like, encourage other uh, strategists to do is like learn the tools that are available to you. Um, I was able to kind of like learn some of these early social listening tools that um, I would kind of go off, do like a quick audit of something um, and then share back with my boss. And it, it got me into rooms that I shouldn't have been in um, where I'm in a room with the, the president on a new business pitch as a junior strategist, only because no one else at the agency was thinking about um, this particular opportunity or this particular tool. So there's still a lot of those opportunities, even if you're not working directly with the client, um, to take that same type of mindset, regardless of what department that you're in, of like, okay, how can I find these opportunities and then bring them back to the team? I think to that point too, I, there have been moments where there are junior strategists in our company, um, and one of our clients had their big quarterly earnings calls. And I remember two of the strategists, uh, just they listened to the call and they provided this really intelligent, insightful like download on that was a byproduct of that earnings call and they left it on everybody in the in the company's desk. 
And it's one of those things that it was so smart of them and so bold of them. And, but like that kind of in, intention and that kind of uh, uh, proactivity is the kind of stuff that will get you noticed. And um, like, I, I'd be willing to bet you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in the agency who didn't know both of their names by the end of the day. So I think also looking for opportunities where you can bring value, whether to Adam's point internally or externally will also be ways for, for you to get to get seen um, and to get into those rooms that you may or may not, um, uh, you, you have earned the right to be into. Um, if you flip to the next one, um, media. So I think Adam talked a little bit um, and, uh, and the broader VCU team talked a little bit about my background. I'm, an, I'm a weird one. So I came up through sort of these innovations groups at big media companies. So my job was to identify emerging trends in technology and then come up with really creative ways to use them for brands. So that means that I worked with like uh, Niantic who made Pokemon Go before Pokemon Go existed. I, I remember talking to Alexis Ohanian about Reddit seven years ago. Um, I remember pitching Facebook and being like, guys, it's going to be big. Um, but so because of that, I think um, uh, going from sort of media to strategy and then ultimately creative is, um, I think, uh, I don't, I don't know if you guys know that much about the media landscape, but I'll kind of tell you how it normally works and then how we, how we do things differently and sort of why it's valuable. So, um, so this sort of says it's easy to, to buy an impression. It's harder to make one. Um, one of our partners at our company, uh, Laura Carenti, she's the Tony Soprano of the media world. Um, she has a lot of these sort of bumper sticker quotes, and this is a, a great one, but basically how the media process normally works, and, um, and I think it actually has an outsized impact on the creative that we create, so it's helpful for you guys to know is like, um, most, most people will buy blocking and tackling media, which means they're buying 30 second spots, five second spots, um, a digital banner buy, a social post, um, and, uh, and they're sort of bought and sold in these kind of like prefab, uh, boxes. And oftentimes how that process works is like, a, a media planner or buyer will reach out to NBC and say, what can I buy? When can I buy it? And then they'll kind of build creative that just like neatly fits into those slots. Um, but a big part of what we do as a company and part of our special sauce is we don't RFP. So we don't ask other people for their ideas. And instead what we do is we, um, we, we ask what can we make? And we kind of look at, we look at the, uh, what a, a publisher, a vendor, a partner is really good at, whether that's NBC or Snapchat AR. And then we look at what our brand is trying to do. And we just come up with an idea irrespective of what can be bought and sold. And then we build it with those people. And what that allows us to do is make things that people really notice that get noticed. We don't necessarily think in 30 second spots or five second spots. We think in terms of what's the best idea for this client and how can we make as much noise as possible with the dollars that we have. So um, so all of that to say, uh, GE we've had as a client, I think from uh, since our inception, I've been working on the business for almost uh, for probably 10, 10 years. Um, but one of the things that they said to us uh, is that uh, GE is the oldest startup in the world. It was started by Thomas Edison. And so the mandate from their CMO was our marketing should be as innovative as our business. And I think sometimes uh, a lot of us will think in terms of how a strategy can lead to a creative idea, but we don't always think about how we can pull that same strategy through to our media, which, which means that um, if GE wants to show up as a startup and they want to show up in the most innovative way, then that means we're always going to be on emerging platforms. That means we're always going to be sort of inventing like new bold ideas um, that, that really sort of make the industry kind of turn its head. And I think Adam and I have worked on other uh, accounts where when you can really pull that strategy through to um, to kind of using the medium as the message, it can it can lead to some really creative, really interesting ideas. So we'll punch you guys through some of those some of those examples. Um, so the message, uh, 
I don't know if, if you guys have seen this. It's it's been a minute since it came out, but um, sort of going back to that mandate of uh, of trying to make the the media um, that we come up with as as creative and innovative as the company. Um, we saw that podcasts were sort of on the rise um, and nobody had branded podcasts at that time, but we thought uh, uh, this was like a really interesting ripe area for us to push into. So we created a Cyreal podcast that kind of spoofed or parodied the style of like Serial at the time. So if you remember like the really somber voice that she used and, and stuff like that. So we found all those like ticks that belonged to that category and wrote a fictional podcast um, and wove GE's, um, uh, GE's audio technology and sonar technology into this plot line about decoding an alien message from space. Um, so that was us just saying like, this might be a new media channel that we can reach people through. And then in it, to the gift conversation, it started as a gift. It started as a cold call to the client, like, wouldn't it be fucking cool if we created a podcast? Um, and then, and they were like, yes, it would. And we, we actually found the guy who was behind GE's old school radio hour, um, uh, the son of the guy who was behind GE's old school radio hour and collaborated with him to, to craft the whole thing. And it went to number one in the iTunes store and things like that. So I think we, we all sometimes forget that there are things that we consume or trends that we notice, whether it be like Substacks or NFTs. Um, but if you're taking notice of those as an individual, odds are you could you could use it for a client. And I think this is a great example of that. If you flip to the next page, um, New York Times Google Cardboard, this was really similar. Um, so uh, there was a big announcement uh, that, uh, that Google was coming out with these cardboard VR headsets that were going to make sort of VR accessible because at the time you had to purchase like the clunkier headsets. Um, and it, this idea was really born uh, over beers at South by Southwest, where one of the people on our team was talking to the New York Times, and they kind of realized like, oh, you guys put papers on people's doorsteps. Would you ever entertain the possibility that we could put something else in there? And they were like, yeah. So we uh, pitched it to, to GE. This was also a gift um, where we said, let's um, put GE branded Google Cardboards uh, with the Sunday paper on Sunday mornings and craft a VR series um, that sort of helps uh, tell the story of GE alongside sort of really lush photojournalistic content um, that ultimately reached uh, 1.3 million New York Times subscribers. If you flip to the next page, Drone Week. So uh, GE has these, and all again, these are all just examples of making sort of the, the medium as innovative as the company itself. So uh, GE has sort of been digitizing themselves as a company for quite some time. Um, and, uh, and they have drones that also like oversee um, like robotic uh, windmills and all of these different uh, wind farms and all these different things. And so we were asking ourselves, how do we tell that story in a way that's exciting or enticing or interesting? And drones were just kind of bubbling up in the public consciousness. And so we reached out to Vice and said, what if we created Shark Week for drones? And we called it Drone Week. And so uh, we partnered with Vice across like on air, digital, et cetera, to, to really program an entire week of drone-based programming and included um, uh, drone coverage from Chile and some of the most remote um, corners of, of, the, of the GE facilities and centers. Um, so we'll show you just a little bit of a taste of, of what that looked like. If the audio plays, but it might not. It's okay, Adam. It might be because you have headphones in too. Um, so this is funny, uh, but part of what you guys will see, uh, what we tried to do is like GE on its face, it can be like really stodgy and old and stuffy. And so there was also this really nice tension and juxtaposition and partnering with Viceland, which is, you know, pithy and accessible and youthful. Um, and I think in this particular example, like GE clients aren't normal or GE customers aren't normal customers. They're people who will like see something and be like, oh, I'll buy, I'll buy that wind turbine for a million dollars. Um, and we actually got sales off of the, the Viceland interaction where some people saw the, the drone week series and they're like, I'm going to buy, I think we sold a wind turbine and a, 
a, a, a, a, a couple, a fleet of airplanes, um, which ends our, up- our best metric to date as an yeah. agency, like sold <laughs> wind turbines. Sold wind turbines. <laughs> Um, so, uh, again, I think like a big part of what Adam talked about at the top and even for us as an agency is, is like, don't just because at face value, the brand could might seem boring or it might seem B2B there's opportunity to make things exciting. Um, this last one was, uh, uh, GE has these super materials, um, which are these, uh, they are what they sound like. They're these they were trying to figure out how to tell the story of these really complex, complicated things that have tremendous value. Um, and so what we decided to do is uh, kind of turn products into an opportunity to tell GE's super material story. So GE actually contributed the materials to the original moon landing, different parts of the original moon landing. So um, from the satellite to the thermoplastic rubber that was in the, the sole of the boots, um, and so, uh, it, what's funny, I worked on this in ignition factory, and then I also worked at giant spoon. Um, so we pitched this idea of what if we use GE super materials to create, reimagine the moon boot for the lunar anniversary, So the anniversary of the moon landing. And so we partnered with this company called Android Ohm, who was really hot in this, in the sneaker space and Thrillist, who at the time was a really big deal. Um, and we used those GE super materials in, in the, the boot to sort of help tell that story in a human way. So you'll see the sole of the boot uses that thermoplastic rubber. Um, the side of the boot actually, um, like that darker gray material was uh, the same as what's uh, used on um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the engines and turbines. It's actually like ripped from, from some of the same blades that um, make like uh, uh, airplanes go. And we dropped these with Thrillist and they sold out in seven minutes. So I think each of these examples, whether it's uh, partnering with um, New York Times uh, for VR. Uh, oh, and this last one, Audio Zoom was another one with New York Times where as that company has grown, we saw that they have the opportunity to um, not only have the magazine, but also have the app. Um, and most of the people who are their subscribers have both. And we had this idea for years of like, wouldn't it be cool if we had an audio zine? So if you turn every page and it's sort of like full technicolor, like gorgeous imagery, but it's complemented by sort of an audio soundtrack that um, so it's kind of this multimedia, like multi-sensory experience. And we'd been kicking that idea around for years and we just couldn't find a home for it. Um, and then uh, we were able to actually sell the New York Times on it. Um, so they did an entire issue called Voyages. That was the first issue of New York Times Magazine that was solely imagery. Um, and we wove the GE story into it. So you would turn a page and you could um, explore different parts of the world just through sort of sight and sound. Um, so this was an example of us really collaborating with pitching the New York Times on a format, them owning it and buying it, and then making space for GE's story within that. So I know there's a, a lot of case study examples, but I think there it, it's all to say that um, just because uh, just because an ad isn't somewhere or a brand story isn't somewhere doesn't mean that it should shouldn't be like. And it's best to sort of pitch ideas to some of these partners or publishers, and they might become properties or they might become series or they might become IP that's really owned by this brand where I think especially in a world of ad blockers and, um, and cooking and I think all of us um, hate the like, we all just wait with bated breath to like skip to skip the ad, even if we're in the ad industry, like we need to think outside of spots and dots and and just come up with the most like brilliant, beautiful idea that helps convey the spirit of the brand and sell and sell publishers on it. So, um, okay, another lesson. So that was all under the don't buy an impression, make one. Um, uh, so this, this one, we don't do grand reveals. I think this is another thing of, um, uh, I think what's a little bit tough as a creative, right, is, you really toil over these ideas and, and you wanna make them as, as beautiful as possible. But I think with how people are working today, um, we, Adam and I have found like, it's best to show uh, more ideas more often. And, uh, and the more that 
the client feels ownership the, over the idea, the more that they think that it's their own idea. So like if you have a cursory conversation with a client and you turn an insight from that conversation into the foundation of your concept, you'll increase that, you'll increase that buy-in, you'll increase the likelihood that they'll want to make that thing because they think that they came up with it. So I think there's a bit of a false conception within our industry of like, of course, like we all have egos, we all have like big, beautiful ideas that we want to get seen. But the the more that you sort of muddy the waters between where the idea started and ended, and the more fingerprints are felt on it, and the more that the client can really take ownership over it themselves, um, the higher the likelihood of, of that, of that sell through. I'll also tell you like, uh, breadth is better than depth. Like, I think that sometimes people, anytime that I've gone into a meeting with like 12 different ideas where even if the client isn't like, oh, that one's exactly right. They can see that you are capable of coming up with like this huge spectrum of ideas. And more often than not, they buy the people in the room and they buy their brains, even if that exact execution isn't right. Um, whereas the meetings that don't go as well are the ones where you haven't shown any, anybody anything for a month. And so they're like, what the hell is going to be in this thing? And then you show them two ideas and devote 20 slides to each idea. So more, more often is, is better. Um, Adam, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. No, I think I'll, to, to kind of close us out with our, our last one, then we'll, we definitely want to leave plenty of time for, for questions. Um, lastly, this is one that we talk about a lot, but pitch beyond your capability. Um, I think all the examples we've, we've kind of gone through um, and that this, this next one as well is they are ideas that we knew were right, but we didn't really know exactly how to do it. Um, I think that, and the name that we've kind of given it at Giant Spoon are, are spoon shots, ideas that many believe are impossible. Um, I, there have been so many times I've been in a room, we've a client, we've pitched an idea to a client, a client said, yeah, let's do it. And then we kind of hang up and look at each other and say, oh shit, um, how are we going to make this happen? Uh, but we always do. And I think like for me personally, and us as an, as an agency, like those are the real exciting moments where um, it's not clear how we're going to make this happen, but we know that we can when we get the right people in the room. Um, probably like one of the those bigger moments for us and that is uh, this, this still makes me nervous, um, but when we told our HBO clients, like, what if we build Westworld? What if we create this immersive theater experience that recreates Westworld? And uh, so when we first pitched this, we didn't have any creatives on the team. The pitch team included three strategists, account person, and a producer that came in last minute. Um, and then we sold through the idea and we had to figure out how to make it happen. Um, we, have a, we have a case study video, which I'm gonna skip for now, which you can easily go online and, and check it out. But um, essentially we did make this big recreation of Westworld outside of Austin, 20 minutes outside of Austin during South by where people could come interact with um, hosts or actors playing these uh, AI robots. Um, like 400 pages of a script, like you could drink, uh, you could get drinks, you could get food. Um, there were plenty of like Easter eggs and puzzles. It was very, very intricate. Uh, and if you were to watch the case study video, it, it looks, and it was, it was beautiful to be honest, like the way that it all came together. But there were a lot of failures along the way and it was super risky. I remember one of the early conversations we had with the client, them asking like, do you think people will even get in a bus, drive 30 minutes uh, to go to this thing away from everything else? Um, and we kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, let's, let's make it worth the trip. Um, and that was like the answer. And the thing we had to do is like, if they're going to come, we need to make sure it's like worth their time and everyone talks about it. And this happens all the time. And, um, you know, people, clients will ask like, how can we reduce risk? This makes us nervous. Like we're kind of uncomfortable. It's not what we normally do. And we always try to remind them like, well, that's why you hired us um, to kind of take you into those spaces. And, and one of the lines that I, I love that uh, Nancy Hill, who used to be the president of four A's and has led pretty much every other agency has said to us when those moments come up of saying, of course it's risky because it's never been done before. And that's ultimately what clients are asking for. Like they want to do the never been done, but they really need us to, to walk them through. And that was certainly the case with Westworld. I mean, the, um, 
two weeks before it rained that the whole place was an entire mud pit and we we're like shipping in gravel press night was not good it was it, we were just rushing to the very end i think someone from the press stepped on a rusty nail um i'm not kidding one of the buses nearly tipped over people were stuck at the end of the night like to get back to austin um but we turned it around uh like yes it was risky yes there were failures we stayed up late we figured out how to make it happen and it was a huge success so never let those failures stop you um from pitching something and from producing in the end it really takes kind of like that that right team to continue to pitch and find those ideas like what are the ideas that scare us a little bit that push us beyond our capability uh and i think that's ultimately really what can feel like a a promising and joyful career regardless of where you might go just find yourself in those positions that you can consider continue to push yourself uh so with that said we definitely want to open up we want to talk i know we only have 10 minutes left but uh, we'd love to, to chat and address as many questions as we can great um thank you so much adam and aaron for sharing um just how to like continue to dig deeper and push further um we do have uh one question in the chat um it's from leanne uh, and she asks, uh, NFTs have become a major topic in recent days. How do you think brands will offset the environmental impact they have? And do you think uh, they're here to stay? I guess I'll take it. Um, I, th I think the NFTs are raising sort of an interesting debate. I know, uh, Leanne, there was the Wired article about the sort of environmental impact of NFTs. I think what's really interesting about it is um, I think we sort of have this false perception that anything that is of that is digital um, doesn't have sort of environmental impact. Um, but I think it's it's sort of revealing that some of the things that we make and do that are ephemeral or made out of pixels have a tangible footprint. So I think it's raising sort of a larger philosophical question that I, I'll admit prior to reading that article, I was like, I, I wasn't aware of. And I think a lot of us are becoming increasingly aware of. Um, I do think what uh, NFTs are introducing in general is um, it started kind of 10 years ago. Um, and I remember trying to explain blockchain to clients, but uh, where, uh, we've uh people are are kind of applying this like uh the theory that we have for like currency and money and this notion that we can all just mutually agree to attribute value to things and and um first it started with bitcoin and currency experimenting with that and now we're doing it with um virtual objects uh like it extent that same question extends to like Animal Crossing and people paying a lot of money for some of those virtual objects, as well as like modes of currency. I think it's, I, I think it, uh, clients are going to play in that space. Um, but it, it's more about like brands are living, breathing things. And so as they start to think about what would my currency look like? What, um, what products or services can I provide to people that are utilitarian above and beyond just like an ad object? Um, or like, how can I create things of, of lasting value and significance? I think those are exciting and interesting things to think about. And I think whether that manifests as a non-fungible token or just virtual spaces, I think we're going to continue to see people create and cultivate things in, in virtual spaces. But I think we're all going to have to educate ourselves, continue to educate ourselves on what the environmental impact of, of virtual goods looks like. So. Great. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, if anyone has any, um, we have I one have question. Oh, yep. Sorry, um, Nikki, go ahead. Um, hi, I was interested in um, how do you find out um, the new tech trends before everybody else does? Like, how do you stay on your toes and like? beat them to the punch and stay in the know. Adam, do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? I'll, I'll give my quick my quick answer. Um, it's such a good question. I, I think that we've had some, some moments where we realized like, oh shoot, we're all reading the same thing. Um, that we're all going to the same publications or talking to the same people. And I think a lot of it is ensuring that just the, the talent and the people we have in-house 
um, have different interests um, and different perspectives and are reading different publications and talking to different people. And I think that really ensures that we're, um, you know, finding those new technologies, those new opportunities. And, and we really try to like lean in and tell people like, you know, tell us what you're interested in, tell us what you're passionate, like, what are you reading, like, bring it to work. Um, because it's certainly like that responsibility doesn't sit with with one person or, or two people, but is like the responsible of all of us, um, especially if that's kind of like the culture and the way that we want to think as an agency, it needs to be owned by everyone. Thank you. Um, we have a question from David. Uh, he asks, uh, how have you guys dealt with uh, brainstorming during the pandemic? How do you keep the spark alive at what is known as a private, uh, sorry, uh, vibrant agency? It's a great yeah. question. How do we keep the spark alive? Candles, I just like we're, 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 like we're feeling it and living it right now too. So <laughs> yeah, I think um, I found different things helpful. I'm sure Adam has has builds too. But um, for I, I found like uh, structure to actually be the most helpful. So the way that I've been running brainstorms is like give people like a brief and territories to think around, and then have every single person uh, accountable for coming up with like X amount of ideas and then bring them to the time so that, um, cause I think what's what's really tricky that's the, that like you, that's hard to overcome in a virtual setting is you don't, you wanna make room for all of the voices because there's inherently people that are more extroverted, more introverted. Um, there are people that will talk over one another. So I found it most helpful to sort of say, here's what everybody's accountable for. And we ask account people, strategists and creatives to all bring their ideas to the brainstorm. And each person has to come up with three and we literally go all the way down. And then um, the creative lead on that project, whether it's myself or somebody else will just add sort of build or try to like tie themes together as we go. Uh, but I, I think there's... Um, Sometimes as creatives, we have like a, we're anti-structure, but I actually think that um, structure can, can help just get more ideas more efficiently um, with more inclusivity. All right, uh, we have time for one last question. Um, and this is from Craig. Uh, and he asks, it feels like brands act, uh, like brand acts and earn activations are really popular. Do you have any additional advice on how to concept for these type of asks similar to the Westworld activation? Yeah, I, I think probably the biggest piece of advice I give, and this is something that you know we're we're going through as an agency that we have we were doing so many uh, physical activations. Obviously, COVID changes all of that, but the lessons and the way that we approach it still remain the same as we start to move more to digital and social, and hopefully back to those physical as well. So the, the one piece I would say is that um, really try to understand and figure out like what is that single concept or that idea or message you want to communicate with an activation. And then like you really need to walk like step by step through the consumer point of view and think that like every little detail is a moment to communicate that message or to further emphasize it. So in the case of Westworld, in a lot of ways, like the strategy and the idea was Westworld, like we're recreating it and we want people to feel like they're there. Um, but we talked about like, we wanna make sure if you are a super fan of Westworld that you come there and there's ways for you to find, to find out like Easter eggs and what's gonna happen the next season. If you have never seen it before, like what's the experience for that person as well? Um, that hopefully will lead them to like, oh, maybe I'll go check out Westworld. But we really thought about everything, not just like once they're there, but what does the sign up and the registration look like? What's the email that they get before they come? Like, what is that bus ride? Like, how do they sign up? What are the conversations they're having? What happens throughout the entire experience? What happens when they leave? And I would just like continue to have like that guiding message start to inform every single touch point. And we keep saying like, especially for those physical um, activations and, and digital, sometimes clients or um, pitches and pitches will ask us like, why giant spoon? What's, what's so great about you? And we tell the people like, we sweat the details, like every single detail we will think about, like nothing is inconsequential. So that's the biggest thing I would say is like, as you start to work on those types of ideas. I think another thing too, uh, Westworld's a tricky one because it's, it's recreating existing IP. I think we, we also have experiential things that we've built where it's um, like for Johnny Walker, uh, we, 
uh, they had a corner grocer and we re reimagined it as a, as a bodega basically. Um, and so I, I think what we, something that we see a lot is like, what, what is the world? And, and we think that way from, from campaigns to experiential activations of, do I know what this world looks like? Do I know what the conceit of it is? Do I know how it behaves? And then to Adam's point, then we fully commit to how that that object behaves. So we had one activation that we did for Under Armour that was a little bit inspired by like a Black Mirror episode. So every single thing about how you interacted was like that. Or um, if it's a bodega, then that means like we're serving things in parchment paper with logos on it and we're putting things in to-go bags and to-go cups that look like that. So I think um, conceptually it's what's a fruitful world that you can crib from or borrow from? And then uh, when you put it up against that brand and you go deeper, does it help make it more interesting? Does it help make it richer? And what happens if you play out all of the, the tropes of that, of that thing, whether it's a theme park or, um, or a, a grocery store? Great, well, if we don't have any other questions, I wanna thank you so much, Adam and Aaron. I definitely heard some approaches that I wanna to apply to a couple of my projects right now. So thanks so much, we really appreciate you. And I believe now, um, we're